I'm standing on the banks of the Lower Snake River in eastern Washington state. Now, it wasn't that long ago that this river was home to one of the largest salmon runs in the world. But today, those salmon are all but extinct, entirely because of the aging Lower Forest Snake River dams. Now, these dams block access to hundreds of miles of habitat, depriving this keystone species of their natural spawning grounds. Now, these dams were supposedly built for hydropower, but they only contribute a small fraction of the region's energy needs. Meanwhile, they have destroyed the ecosystem, bringing the salmon to the brink of extinction while providing no benefits that can't be easily replaced through other means. The only solution is to breach the Lower Snake River dams. Heck, except none of that is actually true. In my opinion, this is the most important environmental issue in the Pacific Northwest. But unfortunately, a lot of what you have been told about the Lower Snake River dams is full of misinformation. And a lot of it's been spread by special interest groups who are spending millions of dollars trying to convince the people of the Northwest that their lives would somehow be better off if these dams didn't exist. So let's go through these myths one by one and discuss the negative talking points around these structures. I don't pretend to know everything about these issues, but there are many verifiable facts that contradict the established narrative around dam breaching. So stick around, keep an open mind, and I promise it'll be worth your while. The four Lower Snake River dams are some of the largest, most remote facilities of their kind in the country. Most of them are hours away from the nearest town, and you'll be lucky to see more than a few grain trucks on your way to some of them. But despite their remote location, these dams are anything but ancient. If anything, they're some of the newest structures of their kind in America, with the furthest upstream dam being finished in 1975. The four Lower Snake River dams are the upper half of a 450-mile-long river highway, officially designated as M84. The Columbia stretch was finished in the 50s and 60s, bringing safe river travel to the Tri-Cities of Washington. The four dams on the Snake were built one after the other upstream through the 60s and 70s, bringing the finished river all the way into Lewiston, Idaho. Instead of hauling overland via trucks or waiting for the railroad to reach 300 miles into the interior, the river highway is cheaper, safer, and requires less fuel than any other option. It really is the most environmentally friendly option possible for transportation. These dams are modern, well-maintained, and have an excellent safety record. They aren't like some 100-year-old failing dam in the Midwest or an obsolete dam left over from a World War I logging operation. These are modern working structures that aren't even halfway through their expected lifespan. So why would the supporters of dam breaching keep misrepresenting that these dams are somehow old? Electricity is used in every aspect of life, from the appliances in your house, to the office buildings that we work in, to a growing percentage of our traffic system, you can't live in modern times without access to power. But the reality is that the vast majority of our electricity in the US comes from fossil fuels. That's right, seven times out of 10, your desk lamp, your laptop, even your electric car is actually being powered by burning fossils. Now, I don't need to tell you about the global effects of putting too much additional CO2 in the atmosphere. Climate change is real and must be taken seriously, which is why anytime we can generate energy without burning fossil fuels, we should do our best to hold on to it. And here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a ton of carbon-free power. Around 60% of the energy generated in this region comes from hydropower, which is simply turning the momentum of falling water into electricity no burning fossils required. These states combined use approximately 186,000 gigawatt hours of energy every year. But the same region actually produces 214,000 gigawatts per year, making the Pacific Northwest a net exporter of power. Now, this is good news for the climate, as it helps make up for the parts of the country that are lagging behind in clean energy. The state of Washington has three of the five largest hydropower stations in the country, including Grand Coulee Dam, which generates so much electricity, it makes every other station in the US small. 
The four Lower Snake River dams are all ranked in the top 25 largest hydropower stations in the country. And if you treated the four dams as a unit, they would be the second largest station on the list. If you were to pick up any of the Lower Snake River dams and transport them to any other river in the US, they would be considered giants of clean energy. The only way you can make them seem small is to frame the numbers in a very narrow way. Like, for example, comparing them to the entire export market of the Northwest, or comparing them to one of the giant installations like Grand Coulee Dam. But when you look at the numbers for what they actually are, the Lower Snake River dams are a major part of the cleanest energy portfolio in all of North America. We often forget that Northwest salmon are technically marine animals. After hatching in freshwater streams, they live 90% of their lives in the ocean, where they eat, grow, and put on the majority of their body mass. After about four years, adult salmon leave the ocean and return to the freshwater streams of their birth to spawn the next generation of fish. This means swimming against the current for sometimes hundreds of miles, past rapids, predators, and yes, even dams. There are thousands of dams in the Pacific Northwest on hundreds of streams, both large and small. But since they were first built, the eight dams on the River Highway have all featured state-of-the-art upstream passage for salmon. Which is why it's weird that we're spending all this time talking about breaching the dams that don't block salmon when there are many dams on the Snake River that do. This is Hell's Canyon Dam, 137 miles upstream of Lower Granite Lake. This is the end of the line for migrating salmon. Nothing can get past this point. In fact, there are three other dams upstream of this one that also block salmon, including one that was built back in 1905. But we don't talk about this or other dams in the Hell's Canyon complex. Why is that? The truth is that to a salmon, a 10 foot tall impassable dam is the same as a 100 foot tall dam. And all over the Northwest, there are thousands of small, unimpressive things that block habitat. Culverts, dikes, poor riparian protection. 200 years ago, every stream, brook, and high mountain creek was potential spawning habitat. And thousands of miles of that habitat was lost to dam building in the early 20th century. Before that, even more was lost to mineral extraction and other early industrial operations. Not a single mile of habitat is blocked by the Lower Snake River dams, but you never hear about this from the supporters of dam breaching. There's a pervasive narrative out there that the Lower Four Snake River dams are obsolete and that their benefits can be offset through some simple investments in infrastructure. Now, these dams produce a long list of benefits to the people of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and the surrounding regions. But let's focus on the biggest two, power and navigation. The four dams are capable together of producing over three gigawatts of energy and annually produce about the same amount of power as the greater Seattle area uses every year. And replacing this energy is no small feat, but it is technically possible if you add up enough generating stations. The problem here is that the supporters of dam breaching are trying to convince you, the public, that you can replace the spinning generators of a hydroelectric plant with the spinning generators of a wind farm. And that's like comparing apples to some other food that's not even a fruit. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with wind power. After all, it doesn't use fossil fuels, just like hydro. And it also doesn't use any consumables that aren't immediately replaced also like hydropower. But the big difference that really matters here is that hydropower can be turned on and off at the push of a button as demand fluctuates throughout the day. This is called dispatchability, and it's a big deal when it comes to running our power grid. Keeping the lights on in America is a 24-7 balancing act. All electricity must be used the moment it's created, which is why grid operators are constantly altering the supply of energy to match the minute-by-minute -minute demand. As a normal part of operations, as our power usage tends to rise in the morning as the workday begins, crest around noon as AC units fight against the heat of the day, and then dip a little in the afternoon before spiking hard when everyone gets off work and turns on kitchen appliances and the TV at the same time. This constant change in demand is only manageable if you have a steady supply that you can draw from at a moment's notice. And wind and solar are anything but steady. 
Now, the good news is that our grid is large enough to handle the natural variations that occur when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. And there's nothing wrong with using wind and solar power as part of our green energy future. All carbon-free energy is good energy. But for every non-dispatchable power source you connect to the grid, you need another dispatchable one running to balance the load. And guess which power source is currently being used to balance all the new wind and solar farms being built in the inland northwest? Yeah, you guessed it, it's the hydropower dams. For every wind farm, you need a facility like a dam to balance the load. If you don't, the next best thing is a natural gas power plant, which kind of defeats the purpose of building new clean energy. Most people aren't aware that wind farms and dams have this symbiotic relationship, and they actually work together to make sure that our grid emissions stay low. This is why it's so bizarre that people are being told that we will demolish working clean energy and replace it with less reliable clean energy. Just because it somewhat works out on paper doesn't mean that it works out in real life. It's like saying that we're gonna take away your 500 horsepower pickup truck and replace it with 500 real life horses. Sure, it's the same amount of power on paper, but in the real world, it just doesn't work. The second major benefit of the Lower Snake River dams is the river highway, or transporting goods and materials by barge. Over 7.3 million tons of cargo are moved on the river every year, from harvested grain to fertilizer, wood products, and even fuel. All of this cargo would have to be transported on land if the river highway was taken away or shortened, which would have a negative ripple effect and would undermine our environmental goals in a big way. Now, most people are aware that transporting cargo by train has a much lower carbon footprint than transporting by truck. But you get another big improvement in emissions when you move to the water. In fact, water transportation is the most climate-friendly way to move goods worldwide. A fully loaded grain barge can typically move its cargo the length of the river for around 150 tons of CO2 released in the atmosphere. That same load by train will cost you 264 tons, and going by truck will cost the climate a whopping 1,058 tons of CO2. Water transportation is not only our oldest form of transportation, it's also the most climate friendly. But what if you had to move all that grain on trains as is currently being proposed? But first of all, the track capacity doesn't exist in the corridor. You would need a multi-billion dollar investment in upgraded track lines. Not to mention the fact that our rail system currently has a severe shortage of rolling stock and the labor to manage it. But let's say you did. Let's say you upgraded the rails, bought enough train cars, and hired enough railroad workers to completely replace what our river highway is already doing. Every ton of cargo would now make it to its destination slower, affecting market prices and putting Northwest growers at a competitive disadvantage. Every ton of cargo would now be more expensive, putting the American ag industry at a global disadvantage. But worst of all, the total emissions for transporting all that cargo that used to go on the river would increase by a whopping 1.2 million tons of emissions per year. Combined with the nearly 4 million tons of emissions every year, estimated as a result of replacing hydro stations with wind and natural gas, and demolishing the dams would have a net negative effect on the climate of around 5.2 million tons of CO2 each and every year. That's more than the emissions from every car, truck, factory, and high-rise in the entire city of Seattle. This brings us to the biggest myth of all, and it's the one at the center of this entire debate. You see, no one wants the salmon to go extinct. Nobody wins if this keystone species disappears from our waterways. So what are we supposed to do? When Lewis and Clark explored the Pacific Northwest in 1805, they noted just how abundant the salmon runs were, and how the natives talked about there being so many fish that they could virtually walk across the river on their backs. The traditional narrative says that we once had abundant salmon in the rivers, and then the dams were built and the salmon went away. And so through the transitive property, if we remove the dams, the salmon might come back. But there's one major flaw with this argument. The salmon actually didn't go away when we built the dams. You see, the salmon runs had already been decimated long before the dams were ever built. It's hard to know exactly how many salmon existed pre-colonization, 
but some estimates place it at between 10 and 15 million returning adults per year. But when the first fish counting officially began in 1938, only half a million adult salmon and steelhead migrated here that year. And these numbers held steady through the 1970s and even rose substantially in the later half of the 20th century as major hatchery operations were scaled up. We know for an almost certain fact that the original salmon runs on the Columbian Snake Rivers were decimated between 1880 and 1920, decades before any dams were built. This was a period of intense industrialization, with virtually zero care given for the environment or the ecosystem. And if you look at photographs of the Portland-Vancouver area during this time period, the shoreline is dotted with these enormous structures in the water called fish wheels. Now these things scooped out everything that lived in the river and sent them to one of the hundreds of canneries that exported salmon worldwide. We will never know the true impact of this time period because nobody was counting back then. But since 1938, we have a record of every single adult fish that has passed above Bradford Island on the Columbia River, including every adult fish destined for the Snake River. And the total size of the run looks nothing like what many are referring to as abundance. Based on real world data collected over the past 80 plus years, there is a near 0% chance that salmon as a species will go extinct in the Pacific Northwest in our lifetimes. The only way you could claim otherwise would be to narrow down the definition of the word species so that it doesn't represent the reality of the ecosystem. If the dams were the primary reason why the salmon runs have declined, then you should see a solid before and after with each dam built on the river system. But you don't. It's far more complex than that. Habitat loss, pollution, ocean temperature. There are so many factors affecting the life cycle of a salmon. The obstacles in the river are just one of them. There's no evidence that removing these four dams that do not block salmon migration will have an overwhelmingly positive effect on the health of the river. And there is a ton of evidence that removing the dams would be an enormous net loss for the climate and the environment. We have to look at the full picture and not just the framing that supports a foregone conclusion. This issue is complex, and there's no one solution that solves every problem. But if I was to sum up my argument, I would do it in the form of a question. Do you believe that climate change is real and that the sustainability of the Pacific Northwest is important both for our present and our future? If you answered yes, then you have to be in favor of keeping the Lower Snake River dams. What do we want our environment to look like in 50 years? Do we want to go backwards? To see our food supply get interrupted? Our trade restricted? Our transportation sent back to the Industrial Revolution? Where do we want our energy to come from? Are we content to see our power grid degrade? To experience flickering lights and rolling blackouts? Or do we want to go forward? Towards a more sustainable future, where power is safer more reliable and more economical. Where agriculture cares for the land and cares for the planet. Where the Lower Snake River dams continue to serve as a vital piece of our sustainable future. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and would like to see more content like this, be sure to follow me on all the different platforms. This channel is 100% independent media. We are entirely bootstrapped and crowdfunded. So if you're interested in helping myself and my team produce more content like this, visit armchairengineer.com to see how you can become a supporter.